You've all been living in New York and most of us around the country as well of late, a kind of daily plebiscite, if you will, about history and memory. Um, nowhere more than here among New Yorkers. In a book by Eric Hobsbawm, published about uh, five, six years ago, called The Age of Extremes, A History of the World in the 20th Century, <laughs> an attempt at an epic history if ever there was one. You may know this book. At the outset, Hobsbawm asked 12 eminent scholars, artists, musicians, from all over the world to comment very briefly on what they thought the, the greatest legacy of the 20th century would be. Almost every one of them mentioned the level of violence of the 20th century. Many of them, of course, mentioned science as well. A couple mentioned the revolution in women's rights, but almost all of them mentioned violence. There's one very simple but interesting comment that may be poignant for our own moment. It comes from the Spanish anthropologist Julio Carlos Baroja, who captures the incongruence between individual survival and comfort and the horrific violence of our age. There's a patent contradiction, says Baroja, between one's own life experience, childhood, youth, and old age passed quietly and without major adventures, and the facts of the 20th century the terrible events which humanity has had to live through. We can hope, of course, that the 21st century will not leave us with eminent scholars at the end of it saying the same thing. It seems that throughout our history, Americans have been embracing and then losing their innocence. We have a rich historiography that shows us how American society moved from a sense of boundlessness to consolidation, as John Hyam put it in a famous essay, from the antebellum period through the Civil War era. The end of American innocence was proclaimed over and over for, World War, for the World War I era as a 19th century set of seemingly stable and secure values collided with total war, modernism, internationalism, and a new world order. Indeed, Henry May wrote a brilliant book by that very title, The End of American Innocence in 1959, focusing on the years 1912 to 1917. He probed the ways what he called a dominant American credo, three great ideas or values collapsed from both external and internal pressures and contradictions. The three values, according to May, were one, the belief in the certainty of a set of universal moral values. That, that the world was essentially moral. The second was a belief in the inevitab inevitability of human progress, that people and history itself were somehow always already getting better. And third, that faith in a traditional, essentially European high culture, especially in literature and the arts, as a model for the world. Yet another brand of American innocence seemed to take hold in the certainties and the prosperity and the consensus, if you like, of the post-World War II period of 1950s America. And much of that seemed to come apart in the 19, 1960s with a series of assassinations and especially the Civil Rights Revolution and the Vietnam War. And now, in just the past two weeks, we are confronted yet a, with yet another assault on what many commentators are yet again calling our American innocence. The attack on New York and Washington was, of course, much more than just that. But we have been, understandably, in a state of collective shock, mourning, and for some, despair. We are reeling from the awful realization that we have been attacked with our own technology by people living in our own midst, at our own symbolic sites, by people who, it appears, seem to hate some of the very Enlightenment ideals that hold our pluralistic society together at all. In the past two weeks, we have experienced collective grief, a sense of collective vulnerability, and a widespread expression of collective memory. We have tried to find our feet with historical analogies. Pearl Harbor for the shock of the attack on American soil, 
Antietam or Gettysburg for a sense of comparable death and suffering. The nearly 5,000 dead at Antietam in one day, the bloodiest day of the Civil War, were of course soldiers and not civilians in their workplace. I am only a historian like many of you, and I don't really trust my initial responses to anything. My first, second, or third response. We need a longer view before knowing the nature of this particular national trauma. But just as we are laying down a collective memory as we speak in this outpouring of discussion and analysis of the meaning of September 11, we are trying as best we can to probe, to use, to perhaps steady ourselves by looking back into our historical memory as a guide, a template, or just a source of understanding. Americans have a long history of gaining and then somehow losing their innocence. We also have an equally long, albeit we do not like to sometimes embrace, history of tragedy. In his book, Faith and History, Reinhold Niebuhr wrote with great insight about this relationship of tragedy to innocence. The capacity to live in the past by memory, says Niebuhr, emancipates the individual from the tyranny of the present. People can, in Niebuhr's words, seek asylum from the present tumults in a past period of history, or use memory of a past innocency to project a future of higher virtue. But Niebuhr left this warning about how we think about healing and justice from historical trauma. The processes of historical justice, wrote Niebuhr, are not exact enough to warrant the simple confidence in the moral character of history. Every execution of moral judgments in history is inexact because of its necessary relation to the morally irrelevant fact of power. Now, it seems that nearly all people share a universal human impulse to shield their memory from being swallowed up in what Vladimir Nabokov once referred to as the ooze of the past. We don't want our memories to be lost somehow in an oblivion. How we as Americans remember the Civil War or remember slavery, Reconstruction, and for that matter, the modern civil rights movement, have long been now indexes to some of the deepest problems and greatest stories in American history. Indexes, if you like, into what we like to embrace in our past and perhaps what we evade, and I suppose to what we have reconciled or not reconciled. In this book on Civil War memory, I assess all sorts of individual memories, that is, actual remembered experience in letters and memoirs and speeches and debates in autobiography of all sorts. But my primary concern is, of course, with collective memory, the ways in which groups, peoples, or nations remember, how they construct versions of the past and employ them for self-understanding or to win power in an ever-changing present. In short, I'm doing what I think all historians of memory are doing, and that is treating memory as an instrument of power. As working terms, it is important to establish, I think, some differences between the concepts of history and memory. They are two attitudes toward the past, if you like, two streams of historical consciousness that must at some point flow together. History is what trained historians do. It is a reasoned reconstruction of the past rooted in research. It tends to be critical and skeptical of human motive and action, and therefore more secular than what people commonly refer to as memory. History can be read by or belong to everyone. It assesses change and progress over time and is therefore more relative, more contingent upon place, chronology, scale, and so forth. Memory, however, is often treated as a sacred set of potentially absolute meanings or stories, possessed as a heritage or identity of a community. Memory is often owned History just gets interpreted. Memory is passed down through generations. History gets revised. Memory often coalesces in objects, in sacred places, um, in sites, in monuments of all sorts. 
History seeks to understand contexts and all the complexities of cause and effect. History asserts the authority of academic training and recognized canons of evidence. Memory carries the often more powerful authority of community membership and experience. Or as the French historian Pierre Nora puts it, memory dictate, dictates while history just writes. Such separations are not to suggest that these two attitudes toward the past are everywhere distinct. History and memory must be treated as unsteady, conflicted companions in our quest to understand humankind's consciousness about the past. In the confluence of history and memory, we will find much of what is most exciting and troubling about how nations and communities use the past. The concept of individual memory is, of course, easier to grasp than that of collective memory. In one of the oldest but deepest reflections on the subject, St. Augustine, in the Confessions, was awed by memory. And you may know that text. It has that 40 to 50 page meditation on the nature of memory. Great is the power of memory, writes Augustine. A fearful thing, oh my God, a deep and boundless manifoldness. And this thing is the mind, and this am I myself. In a real sense, as Augustine, I think, says, we are our individual memories. We cannot function without them. But we also know that nations and other human groups devise, however elusively, collective memories. And they transmit them through myths, traditions, stories, and rituals, and even formal interpretations of history. Indeed, what scholars used to call and examine as myth transformed in the 1980s and 1990s into the study of memory. What, is, what historians studying memory have come to understand is simply that the process by which societies or nations remember collectively itself has a history. And that by writing those histories, we enrich our understanding of the very idea of the past and our relationships to it. Now, how do we know, though, a collective memory when we meet one? What constitutes a memory community or a memory group? These are elusive but essential questions. A scholar of nostalgia in a recent book, Svetlana Boim, aptly calls collective memory, in her, in her words, a messy, unsystematic concept. And it is. But it is nevertheless indispensable to understanding how people comprehend themselves in time. Collective memories may be troublesome and multiple, and the plots and narratives they foster are contradictory, but they are the cultural frameworks, conscious or not, that give shape and meaning to our lives. And there's a debate now among historians whether nations really remember collectively or if it's just groups within a nation that remembers. Uh, that may be a rather arcane argument. Nations may or may not remember, but nations are the evolving creations of high-stakes contests between groups that do remember and contend to define the past and the present and the future of national cultures. Is the United States the nation that preserved itself in the war between the states, or the republic that reinvented itself in a civil war that destroyed racial slavery and expanded freedom and equality? Was the war of bloodletting on the way to a better, more unified nation, ready to play its appointed role in world affairs? Or was the war a deep national tragedy, the meaning of which is embedded in many different group memories, those of defeated white Southerners, victorious white Northerners, black former slaves, the descendants of free blacks, or European immigrant groups who made up such a significant percentage of the Union Army? Indeed, who owns the memory of the American Civil War? Is it those who wish to preserve the sacred ground of battlefield parks for the telling of a heroic narrative of shared military glory on all sides? Or is it the professional historians with their PhDs determined to broaden the public's interpretation of the Civil War sites to include slavery, social history, women, the home fronts, and so on? Should the master narrative of the American Civil War be an essentially reconciliationist story of mutual sacrifice by noble men and women 
who believed in their equal versions of the right? Or should that master narrative be a complex, pluralistic story of sections and races deeply divided over the future of slavery, free labor, and the unfinished character and breadth of American liberty? If everyone fought for liberty in the Civil War, then whose collective memory of the struggle should have a privileged place in textbooks, films, or on the landscape of memorialization? Indeed, whose claims to liberty prevail? Just by asking these questions, we see how contested the memory of the Civil War can be. Answers to such questions depend, of course, on historical context, on shifting interpretations, and on who controls the mediums and access to historical memory. Collective memories are wielded for political ends, to shape social policy, or to control historical narratives. As the great Southern poet Robert Penn Warren suggested at the occasion of the Civil War centennial in 1961, in his words, the Civil War draws us as an oracle, darkly unriddled and portentous, of personal as well as national fate. As in, as in 1961, so it still is in 2001, that our fates are still linked to how we remember and interpret the Civil War. Would that it were otherwise. To understand the riddle of history's fascinating confluence with memory and with Americans' recurring encounter with the meaning of their most divisive event, we should continue to make memory that power we think about as much, if not more, than we think with. And we should preserve, visit, and study our Civil War battlefield sites. But then we should lift our vision above the horizon, beyond those alluring landscapes, and ponder all the unfinished questions of healing and justice, of causes and consequences, of racial harmony and disharmony that still bedevil a society and our historical imagination. Now, one of the most vexing recent problems, of course, in Civil War memory has been a, a kind of revival of Confederate traditions and Confederate memory and Confederate symbols. We we're all aware of this largely through, uh, in the late 1990s, a debate after debate about uh, the use of the Confederate flag on state-sponsored sites and so forth. Confederate heritage is a fascinating and enduring issue or problem. Why doesn't the Confederacy just go away? <laughs> it only lasted for four years. Lots of things in American history lasted a lot longer than did the, the Southern Confederacy. What is it about the Confederacy that gives it such an enduring place in our cultural and historical memory? Is it because defeat is simply more interesting than victory? Is it because the underdog is so often in many ways more interesting than the side that wins, especially when the side that wins seems to win by superior industrial power? Is it because controversy attracts? Why is it that when European Civil War buffs come to the United States, and there are a lot of them, very few of them come looking for Grant's tomb over here on the Hudson, but a lot of them want to go find the Robert E. Lee sites. They want to go to Richmond. They want to see Monument Avenue. Why are there more monuments to Nathan Bedford Forrest, according to James Lowen's book, Lies Across America? Now, I cannot verify this, and Jim Lowen's footnotes are... <laughs> I, don't, I, I He must have gone out and counted them, but in Lowen's book, he says there are more monuments to Nathan Bedford Forrest than any other American Civil War figure. Why? Is it because the Confederacy in some ways represents what Albin Tourget wrote in the late 19th century, the fact that it was, in his words, glorified by disaster. Is it somehow Americans, for Americans, uh, an old empire that got crushed? Are we a little bit like the other cultures in the world, like the British, who experience a great deal of nostalgia for one reason or another, in one way or another, for a lost past of, uh, past of some kind of empire? Is it the death of empires that make us nostalgic? What is nostalgic? 
We're always taught that nostalgia is for that which we've lost, and it clearly is. But other, some students of nostalgia also tell us that nostalgia is also for that which we have ourselves destroyed. Is it also because failed heroism fascinates us? and that failed evil sometimes fascinates us even more. The Confederate traditions, and that's a big cluster of ideas, I realize, seems to be an endless source for some Americans, an enclave in the past, as um, Niebuhr referred to it, a sanctuary, if you like, another world to live in, which was George Santayana's definition of a religion, where they can be comfortable with their convictions, and comfortable with their prejudices. Now, finally, let me get back to the 19th century. There was a wonderful little story that appeared in the Confederate Veteran Magazine in 1894. Uh, if any of you have done any kind of research on Civil War memory, you may know what a wonderful source that magazine is. It was published for, I think, 35 years out of Nashville, Tennessee. And in 1894, this little story appears without the an author's name, but it's the story of a mother, a southern woman, and her son attending a production, a stage production, in Brooklyn, New York, of the play called Held by the Enemy. The boy asks his mother, what did the Yankees fight for, mother? And as the orchestra strikes up, marching through Georgia, the woman answers, for the Union, darling. And the author says, Painful memories bring sadness to the mother's face as she hears the Yankee victory song. Then earnestly the boy asks, what did the Confederates fight for, mother? And before the mother can answer, the music changes to Home Sweet Home, which fills the theater, again says the anonymous author, with its depth of untold melody and pathos. The mother whispers her answer, do you hear what they are playing? That is what the Confederates fought for, darling. Did they fight for their homes, the boy counters? And with the parents' assurance, the boy burst into tears with what the author calls the intuition of right. He hugs his mother and announces, then, oh, mother, I will be a Confederate. Why do so many little white boys still grow up in America wanting to be Confederates? The Civil War is our felt history. History lived in the national imagination, wrote again Robert Penn Warren in 1961. Somewhere in their bones, says Penn Warren, most Americans have a storehouse of lessons drawn from the Civil War. Now exactly what those lessons should be and who should determine them has been perhaps the most contested question in our historical memory since 1863. When Lee retreated back into Virginia, Abraham Lincoln went to Gettysburg to try to explain the war, and Frederick Douglass took a speech on the road called Mission of the War, in which he declared national regeneration as the sacred significance of the war. Among all those lessons, though, wrote Penn Warren, is the realization, in his words, that slavery looms up mountainously in the story and can never be talked away. But Warren acknowledged another lesson of equal importance. When one is happy in forgetfulness, he said, facts get forgotten. Or as William Dean Howells put it in 1900, what the American public always wants is a tragedy, as long as it has a happy ending. <laughs> in this book, I've tried to write a synthetic history of a 50-year period of how Americans remembered their most divisive and tragic experience. The book probes the inner relationship between these two broad themes of race and reunion. I have focused primarily on the struggle in the first part of the book of both North and South to deal with the dead and the problem of memorialization. And I deal with Reconstruction politics in two chapters, especially those Reconstruction elections and the ways in which raw Civil War memories played out in those elections. I deal with reunion literature, especially the, the wildly popular literature of the Civil War, the plantation school in particular, by the late 19th century. I deal at length with soldiers' memory in, in two chapters at the heart of the book, 
with the reminiscence industry of the late 19th century, with African-American memory uh, in its many complexities. And I do what all historians do. I divide black memory of the Civil War into five varieties. There weren't six or four. There were five, of course, it's, since I imposed that on it. I deal at length with the origins and uses of Memorial Day, and I'll talk about that briefly at the end of the lecture. And then I deal with the lost cause as a set of rituals, the Southern lost cause, and as a racial ideology. In every chapter, I've kept my eye on race as the central problem in how Americans made choices to remember and forget their Civil War. Throughout, I tell these stories with the divergent voices of North and South, black and white, joined in the same narrative. And in every chapter, I've tried to tell uh, stories by using the power and variety of American voices, presidents and generals, men and women, former foot soldiers and ex-slaves, master novelists and essayists, as well as the thousands who crafted ordinary reminiscences, romantics and realists, the victors and the vanquished. I came up with three overall visions of Civil War memory. There weren't four, there were only three. <laughs> and these three collided and combined over time. The first I call the reconciliationist vision of Civil War memory, which took root in the process of dealing with the dead from so many battlefields, prisons, and hospitals, and developed in many ways earlier than the embittered history of Reconstruction has sometimes allowed us to believe. And if you've read the first chapter of the book, you know that I use our deaf poet, Walt Whitman, at some length to try to get at both that problem of memorialization and the problem of reconciliation. The second vision I call white supremacist memory, which took many forms early after the war, including terror and violence, locked arms with reconciliationists of many kinds over time, and eventually delivered the country an essentially segregated memory of the war on southern terms by the turn of the 20th century. And three, the emancipationist vision of Civil War memory, embodied in African Americans' complex remembrance of their own freedom, in the politics of radical reconstruction, and in conceptions of the war as the reinvention of the republic and the liberation of blacks and eventually others as well to citizenship and constitutional equality. In the end, this is a story of how the forces of reconciliation overwhelmed the emancipationist vision in the national culture, how the inexorable drive for reunion both used and trumped race. But the story does not merely dead end in the bleakness of the age of segregation. So much of emancipationist memory persisted in American culture during the early 20th century, upheld by blacks and a fledgling neo-abolitionist tradition that had never died a permanent death on the landscapes of Civil War memory. Now, at the end of the Civil War and in the wake of emancipation, Americans faced an overwhelming task. How to understand the tangled relationship between two profound ideas, healing and justice. On some level, both had to occur. But given the potency of racial assumptions and power in the 19th century, these two aims never developed in historical balance. One might conclude that this imbalance between the outcomes of sectional healing and racial justice were simply America's inevitable historical condition and celebrate the remarkable swiftness of the American reunion. And it was a remarkable achievement to put this place back together in the wake of the Civil War. Paul Buck, of course, wrote a very influential book back in the 1930s, which essentially did just that. It, a book called The Road to Reunion, which celebrated the swiftness of the American reunion. But theories of inevitability are rarely satisfying, at least to me. Human reconciliations are a good thing, and that must be said. When tragically divided people can somehow unify again around aspirations, or around the positive bonds of nationalism and patriotism, reconciliations are to be cherished. But sometimes reconciliations in history come with terrible cost as well. 
The sectional reunion after so horrible a civil war was a political triumph by the late 19th century, but it was not, and perhaps could not, have been achieved without the resubjugation of most of the people the war had freed from centuries of bondage. This is the tragedy, if you like, lingering on the margins and infesting the heart of American history from Appomattox to World War I. For many whites, especially veterans and their family members, healing from the war was simply not the same proposition as doing justice to the four million emancipated slaves and their families. On the other hand, a simple justice, a fair chance to exercise their basic rights, access to land and livelihood were all most blacks ever demanded of Reconstruction. They sought no official apologies for slavery, only protection, education, human recognition, a helping hand. The rub, of course, was that there were so many warring definitions of just what healing was supposed to mean in the South and in the country. In the wake of the Civil War, there were no truth and reconciliation commissions through which to process memories of either slavery or the experience of total war, which, of course, white Southerners had experienced more than any other American. The closest thing we ever had were the Ku Klux Klan hearings of 1870 to 71. Defeated white Southerners and black former slaves faced each other on the ground, seeing and knowing the awful chasm between their experiences, unaware that any path would lead to their reconciliation. Now, Yankee and Confederate soldiers, however, though it would, took, it would take a while, would eventually find a smoother path to bonds of fraternalism and mutual glory. As is always the case in any society trying to master the most conflicted elements of its past, healing and justice, again, as Niebuhr suggested in that quote I used, had to happen in history and through politics. Americans have had to work through the meaning of their civil war in perhaps the only place it can happen, in the politics of memory. And as long as we have a politics of race in America, it appears we are likely to have a politics of civil war memory. For Americans broadly, the civil war has been a defining event upon which we have imposed unity and continuity. As a culture, we have preferred its music and its pathos notions of devotion and sacrifice to its enduring challenges, the theme of reconciled conflict to unresolved legacies. In the half century after the war, as the sections reconciled, by and large, the races divided. The intersectional wedding that became such a staple of mainstream popular culture in story after story and novel after novel, especially in that plantation school of literature, had virtually no interracial counterpart in the popular imagination. Quite the opposite was the case. Race was so deeply at the root of the war's causes and consequences and so powerful a source of division in America's social psychology that it served as the antithesis of a culture of reconciliation. The memory of slavery Emancipation, black soldiers, and the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution never fit well into a developing master narrative in which the old and new South were romanticized and welcomed back to a new nationalism, and in which devotion alone made everyone right and no one truly wrong in the remembered Civil War. In a popular novel written in 1912, a novel called Cease Firing, by the Southern writer Mary Johnston. And by the way, Mary Johnston was a, was a fascinating writer. She's probably not read much anymore at all. She wrote a couple of best-selling novels. To Have and to Hold was probably her biggest seller. She wrote a, a whole trilogy of Civil War novels, one of which was Cease Firing, which itself was very popular. She was a Virginian woman of elite birth and education, Imbued with the lost cause tradition, she couldn't help it to be of her generation and class and be from Virginia. But she was also a progressive woman and a suffragist and an interesting set of contradictions. But at the end of this book, she imagined a telling dialogue that may have captured the memory most Americans then, and maybe even now, 
want to embrace about the Civil War. On the last page of the book, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia is retreating west toward its final collapse and surrender at Appomattox. One Confederate soldier asks another, what do you think it all means? I think that we were both right and both wrong, says the veteran of many battles, and that in the beginning each side might have been more patient and much wiser. Life and history and right and wrong and the minds of men look out of more windows than we used to think. Did you never hear of the shield that had two sides and both were made of precious metal? Now, there was, of course, no lack of honor on either side in that faithful and compassionate surrender at Appomattox. And Mary Johnston captured an honest soldier's sentiment that had reverberated down through veterans' memory by that point for decades. But outside of this pathos and this endearing mutuality of sacrifice among soldiers that came to dominate national memory, another process, of course, was at work the denigration of African-American dignity and the attempted erasure of emancipation from the national narrative of what the war had even been about. That other process led the black scholar W.E.B. Du Bois to conclude in the same year, 1912, as Johnston's novel, that in his words, this country, he said, has had its appetite for facts on the Negro problem spoiled by sweets. Now, if Du Bois was at all correct in his famous 1903 assertion that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, then we can begin to see how the problem of race and the problem of reunion were trapped in a, mutu in a tragic mutual dependence. Now, I want to end just by telling two stories, maybe three, and I think only two, <laughs> from the book. Uh, I try in the book, as a lot of us historians are now trying to do, we're trying to write narrative. We're trying to tell stories within the story. And I want to use a story from the very end and a story from the very beginning. Go with me to 1913, the 50th anniversary, Blue-Gray reunion at Gettysburg, July 1st to 4th, 1913. Uh, this was the largest Blue-Gray reunion ever held, and in some ways the largest spectacle of Civil War memory ever conducted. Civil War memory as it stood in the general American culture in the early 20th century never saw a more fully orchestrated expression than at Gettysburg on that 50th anniversary. There were more than 53,000 veterans of the war who came to Gettysburg from north and south, from all over the country. Um, the states and the federal government raised about two and a half million dollars to put this uh, big event on. Every Civil War veteran anywhere in the country had his train fare paid to Gettysburg. Veterans came from every state in the Union except two, Nevada and one other one I'm forgetting. There were Confederate veterans, there were like three Confederate veterans that came from Minnesota, and there were Union veterans that came from Texas, showing demographic movement and change in American society. It was billed from the very inception of its planning by the Pennsylvania Commission as early as 1908, 1909, when they started planning it, as a festival of harmony, of sectional reconciliation. It was a public avowal of a glorious fight that led to a greater unity. It was, in fact, it was often called in the early years of its planning and in the press eventually, the Great Peace Jubilee. Every governor of every state came and spoke. All the surviving you know, major officers and generals who were still alive were certainly there. They spoke. It was Governor William Hodges Mann of Virginia, himself a Civil War veteran, that struck the keynote of the whole event in his speech. We are not here to discuss the genesis of the war, said Governor Mann, but men who have tried each other in storm and smoke of battle are here to discuss the great fight. And he underscored great fight. We came here, I say, not to discuss what caused the War of 1861, but to talk over the events of the battle as man to man. No time or space was allowed in the four-day spectacle for any discussion of causes or consequences. There was no talk about emancipation or the unresolved history of Reconstruction. No consideration whatsoever of the war's, you could argue, second great outcome by 1913. 
the nation's disaster at racial reconciliation. The peace jubilee of Gettysburg in 1913 was a Jim Crow reunion. There is no evidence whatsoever that I can find, and I looked everywhere, from Gettysburg's own archives to the National War College in Carlisle to the National Archives to newspapers uh, by the dozens. There is no evidence that any black veterans attended or were welcomed. The only evidence I have of a black veteran attending is in the narrative written by a New Jersey Union veteran who describes a meeting, what he called an old darkie, an old black man whom he calls a veteran um, on the roadway. And it's not very clear whether this man was actually a veteran or not. The only blacks at the reunion were the laborers who built the tent city, who built the latrines, and dispense the blankets to the veterans, and I have a photograph in the book of, of them doing that. This stunning and photogenic, photogenic gathering of old soldiers in a massive tent city, and in, in, included an enfeebled reenactment by some actual participants, a part of Pickett's charge. And there was the ubiquitous handshaking for several days, much photographed. And all of this was understandably celebrated in the national press. This was headlines for four days in every newspaper in the United States. This was an irresistible photo opportunity and an irresistible event. If you'd have been within 100 miles of this, you'd have wanted to go see it. There had never been quite such a spectacle of resolution. Thank God for Gettysburg, Hosanna, proclaimed the Louisville Courier-Journal. God bless us, everyone, alike the blue and the gray. The world ne'er witnessed such a sight as this. Beholding, can we say, happy is the nation that hath no history. At a time when lynching had developed into a social ritual of its own horrifying kind, and when American apartheid had become fully entrenched, many black leaders and editors found the sectional love feast at Gettysburg more than they could bear. The black press had a distinctly different take on this reunion. A reunion of whom, asked the editor of the Washington Bee, only those who, in his words, fought for the preservation of the Union and the extinction of slavery, or for those who fought to destroy the Union and perpetuate slavery, and who are now employing every artifice, the editor goes on, known to deceit, his words, to propagate a national sentiment in favor of their nefarious contention that emancipation, reconstruction, and enfranchisement are a dismal failure. Black responses to such reunions as that at Gettysburg in 1913 and a host of other similar events demonstrated how fundamentally at odds black memories were from the national reunion. On the fourth day, July 4th, the keynote speaker was, of course, Woodrow Wilson, recently elected president that previous fall and just inaugurated that spring. Now, Wilson didn't want to go to Gettysburg for this event, and you might easily understand why. He's the first Southern-born president since the Civil War. He's a Virginian. He didn't want to get near this blue-gray reunion right now. He may have also been concerned because his administration had just two months before begun to segregate three agencies of the federal government, beginning with the Treasury Department and the Post Office. But about four, and he had turned down invitations to speak. And also in those years, as you may know, presidents didn't like to go speak at Gettysburg because they always got compared to Lincoln. <laughs> and nobody wanted to get to give their Gettysburg address because it never measured up. About four days before the reunion, an aide walked into Wilson and said, but Mr. President, you, you don't get it. Uh, you got to go. They got 50-some thousand of these old guys coming. It's covered by the international press. You got to go. And sometime in the next four days, he wrote his Gettysburg address. They whisked him into town in what we would today call a flying visit. He got out of the train, he went into a convertible, they drove him out to the giant tent right out on the battlefield where Pickett's Charge climax. They had, built, they had a tent that, that housed about 15,000 of the veterans on bleachers. Wilson came out of the car, entered the tent with a Confederate veteran and a Union veteran on either side, the governor of Pennsylvania, the governor of Virginia, and he went into the tent and he delivered his speech. He declared it, in his words, an impertinence to discourse upon how the battle went, how it ended, or even what it signified, his words. 
And then he went on. He asked a, a sort of a, a, a beautiful rhetorical question. He said, what have the 50 years meant? I quote him. They have meant peace and union and vigor and the maturity and might of a great nation. How wholesome and healing the peace has been. We have found one another again as brothers and comrades, in arms, enemies no longer, generous friends rather, our battles long past, the quarrel forgotten. Except that we shall not forget, he went on, the splendid valor and the manly devotion of the men then arrayed against one another and now grasping hands and smiling into each other's eyes. How complete the union has become and how dear to all of us, how unquestioned, how benign and majestic as state after state has been added to this, our great family of free men. Now that's an understandable speech by the progressive Woodrow Wilson. To go to Gettysburg, we, we wouldn't expect him to go to Gettysburg and talk about race relations. We wouldn't expect that at all. But it is a historical outcome. The Civil War had become the quarrel forgotten on the statute books of Jim Crow America. A nation can have too much memory, but a nation can also forget too much. My second story brings you all the way back to the beginning, to 1865. Go with me to Charleston, South Carolina in the spring of 1865. If you've read my book carefully, it's the opening of chapter three and you already know this story. <laughs> but, and I tell it not because, not merely because of the sentiment in the story, but because it is a classic example of how some remarkable stories simply do get lost in historical memory. Charleston was of course evacuated, many of you know this who are students of the Civil War in February of 1865. Uh, Union gunboats and artillery placements around Charleston Harbor had bombarded the city for eight months. Uh, many of you have been to Charleston and seen the gorgeous architecture of neo-colonial Charleston. For 15 blocks up from Battery Park in Charleston, much of the city was in ruin. Most of those glorious old homes of the, of the um, low country planters were in ruin. Virtually all the white people left the city in the third week of February, and the Union troops moved in. The regiment that actually received the surrender of the city from the mayor was the 21st U.S. Colored Infantry, a black regiment. Most of the people left in the city were black Charlestonians, former slaves. They had seen death all around now for a long time. And they began to get organized and hold a series of rituals and commemorations the first of which was a large gathering in Marion Square, which is to this day the great commemorative space of Charleston. It's where they have lots of monuments, and they're having a big fight there now over whether to have a monument to Denmark Vesey, the <laughs> leader of a would-be slave rebellion. I don't know where that's going at the moment. Anyway, they held a, a, a gathering on the 3rd of March, uh, 1865, in Marion Square, where 13 black women dressed as elegantly as they could get. Um, Representing, they said, the 13 original states presented General Gilmore of the Union Army a flag, a bouquet of flowers, and a fan for Mrs. Lincoln. On March 29, they held a parade of 4,000 black people through the streets of Charleston, led by 1,800 black school children. Dramatically, in the procession, there were two carts that rolled along, carrying on one cart an auction block and an auctioneer selling two black women and their children and the second cart, a coffin labeled Death of Slavery, Sumter dug his grave, 13th of April, 1861. This was street theater in the wake of the war. On April 14, there was a, a huge and famous and uh, much uh, covered celebration out on Fort Sumter. Uh, they crammed about 3,000 people out onto the Fortress Island that I'm sure many of you know. It was four years to the day of the surrender of the fort. This was the raising of the U.S. flag back over Fort Sumter. It was attended by all sorts of famous people. William Lloyd Garrison was there, the abolitionist who wept uncontrollably, we're told, when he heard a band play John Brown's body. Lincoln's personal secretary, John Nicolay, was there to represent the president. The son of Denmark Vesey was there. Martin Delaney, the former black abolitionist, now an officer in the Union Army. Robert Smalls was there, the former slave who had piloted the planter, 
out of Charleston Harbor, a, a, boat, a pilot boat, to his own freedom in 1863. Henry Ward Beecher was the orator of the day. If any of you know anything about Beecher's oratory, there were, there were, there were those who were actually pleased when the wind blew away his notes. And, <laughs> and he wasn't able to quite speak as long as he might have. It was an interesting speech, though, at least the text of it. I don't quite know what he delivered. The problem that Charlestonians faced was the problem of death. And of course, it was that night they held, a, they held a banquet back in the city that night in the one hall that was still in any kind of condition. And it was that very night, of course, that President Lincoln was assassinated at Ford's Theater in Washington. There was death all around. There was a quartermaster's report that came out just after the war that only one-third of the Union dead were interred in any kind of identifiable grave anywhere in the country. It was at that point, as you probably know, that the federal government instituted an elaborate program of national cemeteries. By 1870, there were about 300,000 Union, bur Union soldiers buried in some 73 national cemeteries with about 58% of them identified. The Confederate story of this process of identification and burial and then reinterment eventually back in the South is a much longer and harsher story. What Americans faced, and certainly what, what black Charlestonians were facing at that moment, was an enormous logistical, psychological, and spiritual challenge of memorialization. Again, the black folk of Charleston got organized. During the war, during the last eight months of the war, the Confederates had converted the planter's race course, the horse track, the horse racing track in Charleston. And there were in many ways, there was no more symbolic site to the low country planters than their horse racing track. They had converted that track, though, into a prison. And in the infield of that prison, from exposure, some 260-odd Union soldiers had died during those last months of the war and had been thrown into a mass grave behind the grandstand. And the people of Charleston knew this. A group of about 25 black laborers and carpenters got together, they went and reinterred all the graves in some sort of proper grave site. They built a fence, a high fence, about 100 yards long and some 50 yards deep around this grave site. And they built an archway over an entrance, and, on, and they whitewashed this fence. And on the archway, they wrote the inscription, Martyrs of the Race Course. And on May 1st, 1865, they held a parade at the race course of 10,000 people. The first group was 3,000 black school children who were now in these freedmen's schools that had been founded by missionaries and abolitionists. The schools had actually been founded as much as two years before that in the Sea Islands. Then they were followed by black women, and it was all sort of organized in this way. Then by black men, then by the Union regiments, then by the white missionaries and abolitionists, and then I suppose by whoever else could, could join. As many as could fit gathered into the grave site, five black ministers read from scripture, a black children's choir sang, America will rally around the flag, the star-spangled banner, and several Negro spirituals. We don't know what scriptural readings they read. I couldn't find that. But I have to believe one of them read from Leviticus chapter 25 where it says, For it is the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you. In the year of this jubilee, ye shall return every man unto his own possession. And then after that ceremony, they all gathered back in the infield of the racetrack, and they did what most of us do on Memorial Day. They had picnics, and they listened to a lot more speeches, emceed by James Redpath, the white abolitionist who would later claim all the credit for this in his memoir, the chapter title that read, uh, essentially, How I Created the First Decoration Day. <laughs> he did have something to do with organizing. But black Charlestonians had given birth to an American tradition. This is the first Memorial Day. By their labor, their words, their songs, and their solemn parade of flowers and marching feet on the old planter's race course, they had created for themselves and for us the Independence Day of the Second American Revolution. <laughs>
To this day, the oval of the old race course is still there in Charleston. It's in Hampton Park, which is named for Wade Hampton, the Redeemer governor of South Carolina in the late 1870s. It's on the property also of the Citadel. And one of my hopes and aims is that, and there are a lot of people down there, some people down there at least now interested, that someday we might actually be able to put up a marker there about the original Memorial Day, although they will be up against it because there are lots of towns across America, north and south, that claim to be the site of the first Memorial Day. But they all claim 1866. <laughs> all of the stories I try to tell in this book are prelude in some way to future reckonings. All memory is prelude. Thank you. <laughs>